Dear colleagues, and Filippo Crea, editor in chief of the European Art Journal, welcome to our monthly dialogue. The dialogue, as you know very well uh, by now, are Socratic conversations among journal editors, authors, and readers. Socrates strongly believed that dialogues are the best way to reach the truth. Our dialogues in the post Socratic era are live streamed. The access is free and you are very welcome to ask questions. Please do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And it is now my privilege to ask Professor Robert Atala, executive editor of the European Art Journal, to start the dialogue with Professor John Kahn. The title of this dialogue is Arrhythmias, Arrhythmias narrated by a protagonist, a true protagonist. And now, Robert, please, can you introduce John? Thank you very much, uh, dear Professor Kem, dear Professor Correa, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my great honor and privilege to participate in the new edition of the European Hard Journal Dialogues as co-moderator in the conversation with Professor John Kem. I am sure that there is barely a cardiologist in the world for whom introducing Professor Kem as leading personality in cardiology is needed. Uh, nevertheless, let me briefly summarize a few points from his CV. In spite of his outstanding contribution to the advancement of cardiovascular medicine over the last decades, the biosketch he has sent us is humble, and this certainly is a part of his personality. So John Kemp is an emeritus professor of clinical cardiology at the St. George's Hospital Medical School at the University of London in the UK. He graduated from Guy's Hospital and pursued a career in cardiology at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London before moving to St. George's as British Heart Foundation Professor of Clinical Cardiology in 1986. Professor Kem is a fellow of many professional societies, including, of course, the European Society of Cardiology. He is president and trustee of the Arrhythmia Alliance and founder of the Atrial Fibrillation Association, past editor-in-chief of Europace, currently editor-in-chief of European Heart Journal Case Reports, and importantly, editor of the Shedover, the European Society of Cardiology textbook of cardiovascular medicine and its digital version, ESC Cardiomat. John Kemp has been involved in the production of numerous guidelines, including the ESC guidelines for the management of atrial fibrillation. He was awarded the ESC gold medal in 2005 and the British Cardiovascular Society Mackenzie Medal in 2008. He has authored or co-authored over 1,250 pap papers and 35 books. Last but not least, John is also an expert collector of watercolor paintings and a model railway enthusiast. Let me here add a personal remark. I had the privilege to work with Professor Cam in the board of the era during his presidency. This was for me a unique opportunity to learn and also admire not only his brilliant wisdom and incredibly wide and deep knowledge in cardiology, but also his leadership, systematic working efficiency, generosity, empathy, and humbleness. Dear John, thank you very much for joining us and let us start the dialogue with a rather classical question. Uh, your enormous scientific achievements are in the eyes of our audience probably mostly linked to arrhythmias. Were arrhythmias your passion since the very beginning of your academic career? And if we talk about academic career, what has been for you personally the most difficult moment? Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Robert. It's very kind of you not to elaborate on all of those uh, things that you mentioned. Uh, I started off, of course, as a general cardiologist. I should explain, I'm not a young man. I started work as a doctor when uh, man stood on the moon, 1969, the Beatles gave their last performance, Concord took its first flight. So I'm a pretty old guy now, 
And I trained originally as a general physician and then as a cardiologist. And cardiology itself was really exciting. Amongst the things we were doing, we, we did many transeptal punctures. We did left ventricular apical stabs to get into the left ventricle. Everybody was frightened of crossing the valve, but not of these other techniques, which seem now uh, very uh, extraordinary things to learn as a young cardiologist. But I was working at uh, Guy's Hospital in London. And in Guy's Hospital was a, a cardiologist called Edgar Souten. And Edgar was the guru in pacemakers for most of Europe. So I began to take an interest in cardiac arrhythmias based on that. And then he was working also with a chap called Rose Spurrell. And Spurrell started doing EP in London. And so I was really taken with this. It was brand new in London in about 1972, three, four. And I started to do a bit of electrophysiology we were no longer recording on smoked drums, but it wasn't much better. It was folded mingograph paper. And we used to record literally hundreds of yards of this stuff. And uh, we used to take it home, but it was very heavyweight. And all evening we'd have to measure the distance between electrograms and the plot uh, AA intervals against HH intervals and all of that kind of thing. And so um, I was very excited with it. It was brand new and there was very little of it done in London. I suppose that Dennis Crickler, another big name from the past was the only other show in town. So I was more or less uh, plowing a brand new furrow in London and it was truly exciting. And that excitement really continued all the way uh, through my career because I found this subject to be ever expanding. The knowledge base gets bigger and bigger and you're never at a loss for new information if you're looking after patients with cardiac arrhythmias and you're pursuing science in that particular subject. As far as uh, my scientific achievements are concerned, my career was divided into a period of time when I did what I call deductive electrophysiology. All of you in the audience who were doing this kind of work in the 70s will remember this. It was rather following on from the Pick and Langendorf type of material with ECGs. We were doing exactly the same with electrograms, trying to work out what stimulated what, where the images went to, where the electrograms went to, and so on and so forth. And it was really very exciting. Most of it was looking at sinus node function, AV conduction, HV conduction, uh, stimulating a few arrhythmias, particularly SVT, and so on. It was truly an exciting thing to do. Everything was brand new. But after that, I went on to looking at sudden cardiac death and trying to predict it in a better way than just using the ejection fraction. And I worked with lots of colleagues in London, in particular with Marek Malik, who was a mathematician. And I learned at that point how lovely it was to work with another expert in another discipline. And it's something I encourage everybody to think about. The interface between two disciplines is a very exciting place to, to get to work. And we did lots and lots of stuff with baroreceptor sensitivity, with heart rate variability, and so on and so forth. And then I want, went on to become really interested in antiarrhythmic drugs. This was around the time when CAST was just coming up. It, we hadn't got there yet because I got very interested in class <coughs> one antiarrhythmic drugs. But when CAST happened, I turned my attention to class three antiarrhythmic drugs. And there I did lots of work with the class three antiarrhythmic drugs, some of which never made it, like uh, azimilide, for example, others of which uh, have at least made a good impression, such as dronedarone and so on and so forth. And after that, I went on to look at anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. And I suppose I'm stuck in that arena at the moment. It's again, a tremendously exciting area. New drugs, new 
programs, new trials, new things to do, new things to consider. So very exciting altogether. Thank you very much. And now, uh, the 12th lead ECG remains for over a century I, an indispensable tool to diagnose arrhythmias. How do you see the current, it's a true avalanche of research on the use of artificial intelligence applied to 12th lead standard ECG for predicting a variety of conditions? In the European Heart Journal, we have recently reviewed uh, AI-based prediction of atrial fibrillation, aortic stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, and even diagnosing COVID-19. So where is this going to take us in the next five years? Well, it's absolutely inevitable that this is going to be a major component of the modern science of cardiovascular medicine. It, it essentially... Uh, needed because of the huge electronic component that we have within medicine. We have electronic health records. We have electronic digital for, uh, storage of the raw data of electrocardiograms, of cardiac images, CMR, and so on and so forth. We have huge national databases with so many component parts to them that the ordinary statistical methods that we would usually apply are no longer even possible of, to cope with this kind of data. We need uh, other approaches and AI, which in essence is a simple technique. It looks for patterns. It sees if these patterns can be predictive. And if they are predictive, it can predict an accurate diagnosis. It can predict an accurate prognosis. It can predict with the ECG, as you said, it can predict that atrial fibrillation will develop. It can predict uh, whether or not we, can we will develop uh, pulmonary hypertension, but it's going to become a part of our life. Of course, the black box component of AI and machine learning is I think a real difficulty to many of us because we like to think that we understand mechanisms and the links between mechanisms, but often we can't do that. And with such complicated analytic techniques, we do not know how the information was used to derive a prediction. And that is disconcerting. But I think we're getting used to it. And what will really matter is how accurate are that, those predictions? Of course, we've got to feed data into these black boxes using artificial intelligence, which is meaningful. It is accurate. And if that's the case, then we will solve accuracy issues and noise issues and bias issues with the interpretation of data. And once we have achieved that, then I think we will have much higher quality information on which we can base our practice. It's clear to me that imaging, for example, will be very appealing target for artificial um, intelligence. I doubt whether we'll have uh, cardiac uh, radiologists or CMR experts and so on and so forth in the future. Uh, these techniques will perhaps render such a position unnecessary. But basically, I think that in electrophysiology, we haven't even started. Nobody started with all the big electronic maps we have, for example, of atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation. Nobody's got going with analyzing this kind of material with artificial intelligence. It's an open book we're going to have a tremendous potential reward from using this kind of technology, but we must take care not to overextend it and to validate it in as many ways as possible. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you have mentioned uh, atrial fibrillation as one of your main field of interest. And uh, certainly you spearheaded uh, our interest in these cardiovascular epidemics uh, for more than three decades. 
you have chaired the task forces on guidelines. What do you feel has been the most important scientific achievement at one side, at, at the other side, uh, failure in our efforts to properly manage patients with atrial fibrillation? Well, again, I should go back to the late 1960s and remind you that medical textbooks told us that atrial fibrillation was an alternative normal rhythm in the elderly. It had not been linked to stroke, to heart failure, to dementia, to increased hospitalizations and so on and so forth. It was not seen as a disease. It was seen as an inconvenience in youngsters who'd had too much alcohol. It was the, the need for cardioversion had appeared and had been solved in a way by Bernie Lown in the late 1960s. So we were already beginning to tackle it, but it took from the late 1960s all the way to the present time to really understand what this disease is all about. It's clearly in most people a simply a reflection of underlying cardiovascular diseases an expression of those diseases. And we've tried to tackle it as though it's just an arrhythmia. And clearly we have to tackle the causes of the arrhythmia and we have to tackle the arrhythmia itself. And finally, we have to make sure that the consequences of the arrhythmia are under control. I think we've done reasonably well with trying to tackle the arrhythmia, no doubt we'll talk more about it, but uh, anti-arrhythmic drugs, rate control drugs, and ablation techniques are all tools that we use to deal with the arrhythmia itself, cardioversion, of course. Uh, we've dealt quite well with some of the cons consequences, particularly, I think, with stroke, which has been something in the headlines for the last uh, decade or so. Remember, of course, that warfarin didn't really get used for uh, atrial fibrillation until the early 1990s. It was used sporadically. It wasn't part of any recommendation that patients had to be anticoagulated until the late 1990s. But during the present century, I think we've clearly done pretty well. We're not there yet. We've still got a residual stroke rate, which is in the 1% range, perhaps higher. People don't take their anticoagulants. They don't take the right doses. Doctors don't give the right prescriptions. We have alternative interventional approaches, such as the left atrial appendage occlusion, going very well, but difficult to accept. I think we have had a, a lot of difficulties with really doing the proper studies in atrial fibrillation, or for that matter, in electrophysiology uh, in practice. We are often limited by factors beyond our control. For example, if we take ablation for atrial fibrillation, it's remarkable to me that we've never done a really good study to definitively settle whether ablation is better than antiarrhythmic drugs for hard MACE type endpoints. Of course, we've had the Cabana study, but we all know it took years and years to recruit to that study. Many alterations to the design, to the endpoints during the course of the study, great difficulties in the interpretation of the results. Okay, if you believe in ablation, you can pull some of the results together to support ablation. But if you don't believe in it, there's plenty to tear apart. Now, to me, that is a failure of our profession, that we haven't been able to really sort this kind of thing out. There are reasons, of course. Uh, it's difficult to persuade a patient to be randomized between an interventional and a non-interventional study. It's difficult to blind such studies, of course. It's difficult if you refer a patient for an ablation to then randomize them away from an ablation and so on. 
But this extends way outside atrial fibrillation into other aspects of cardiac arrhythmias. And one thing that I'd really like to uh, mention is the issue of challenging guidelines. Now that we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later perhaps, but it's really interesting how difficult it is to randomize someone away from a guideline recommendation. And we have to start thinking about how that should be done, how it can be done. What's the responsibility of a guideline committee, a task force writing guidelines, if they use information which lawyers would call unsafe, meaning that you haven't got full confidence in the data. So I think that we've done pretty well with managing stroke for one reason or another. Uh, I think we've not done very well with anterior drugs. I think ablation is doing well, but a long way to go to, to address the, the direct question you asked me. Thank you very much. Let us stay for a while in, in this area. So one of the uh, still, uh, one of the controversies which is still alive is uh, re rhythm versus rate control. So in the light of the, all the recent randomized trials, it appears that the clinical practice is for me still too much anchored in the rather, I would quote, nihilistic approach uh, based on the AFFIRM trial. Uh, uh, what is for you the timely message from the available evidence on rate versus rhythm? Well, like me, Robert, you are an electrophysiologist. And like me, you think the approach is nihilistic. But there's a, an abundance of people who think that the rate versus rhythm controversy was settled years ago and that for various reasons, although there was no clear advantage to rate control, it was accepted as the first line therapy for the majority of patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, I have never been happy with that, and I'm sure you haven't. How can it be that we would be happy to leave somebody suffering from an arrhythmia so, with so many adverse consequences? The answer, of course, is we hadn't shown any better way of dealing with it. But empirically, it seems quite clear that if we could restore sinus rhythm in a way that is not harmful in itself, then we should improve the patient's outlook. And therefore, I and many others like me have been trying to solve this kind of problem. I think what we have to realize is that the main studies that investigated this um, now 15, 20 years old uh, were done in relatively old populations with atrial fibrillation that had been present for various periods of time, much of it long-standing atrial fibrillation in patients who had already significant cardiovascular disease, who had significant uh, cardiac anatomical and substrate changes. The, the techniques that were available did not include ablation, didn't include some of the anterior drugs that we now have available. It, it certainly didn't always look after the patients properly with regard to anticoagulation, some of the possible consequences. The, some of the causes of the arrhythmias were not properly dealt with in terms of uh, management with anti-heart failure drugs and antihypertensive drugs and so on and so forth. So it is time for a reassessment. And although we had, I think, seven so-called rate and rhythm control trials, only one of them, the J-rhythm trial, showed any particular advantage. But we did over the years between those trials and now have quite a few studies from registries that showed that people receiving antiarrhythmic drugs did better than those just on rate control drugs. They had less strokes, for example, than people on rate control drugs, even when using really high class propensity matching to try and make sure that the antiarrhythmic uh, treatment was not just selecting patients who were of better prognosis and so on. And more recently, of course, we had the, with dronedarone, 
the first antiarrhythmic drug where a trial was done prior to its approval to show that it was safe. And that safety trial, Athena, demonstrated it had lots of advantages. It had less cardiovascular mortality, statistically less cardiovascular mortality. The all-cause mortality was reduced, but not statistically reduced because uh, it was an elderly population and um, so many other causes of death. But hospital admissions were massively reduced. Stroke, although a post hoc analysis, was reduced. Myocardial infarction was less in the dronedarone treated group. Now, for various reasons, dronedarone's had its ups and downs since then, but it was a signal that perhaps an antiarrhythmic approach to management of patients with atrial fibrillation could be better than rate control. And in many ways, you can think of a, the Athena trial as a rate versus rhythm control trial. And more recently, of course, we've had the EAST trial, EAST or AFNET4 trial. This was specifically designed to take patients who had just got their first attack of atrial fibrillation. And the average number of days was 36 days from the onset of the arrhythmia to being randomized in the study. And the randomization was to early rhythm control or guideline mandated treatment, which is essentially rate control, unless the patient remains highly symptomatic, in which case you can offer rhythm control. The trial followed that uh, pretty precisely. Uh, there were only about 7% of patients who didn't get rhythm control at baseline in ECF in the rhythm control group. And there were only uh, five or 6% of patients who got rhythm control in the rate control side of the uh, trial. And the trial did show that all cause mortality, cardiac mortality rather, was reduced significantly, that uh, hospitalization for ACS and for, uh, for heart failure were reduced, but not significantly so, and that stroke was significantly reduced. And the primary endpoint, a composite of all of that, was statistically significantly reduced. Now that again is a new version of a rate rhythm control trial. And it's quite clear that rhythm control may well have advantages that we are now able to demonstrate. I don't think East AF solved the problem, but I just point you to, for example, all the recent trials that have been published comparing cryoablation and antiarrhythmic drugs in early onset atrial fibrillation, all showing much better results from cryoablation in terms of the abolition of the arrhythmia, and some showing events like hospitalizations being reduced and so on. Clearly, it's time to start again to pursue this particular big controversial question. And I, for one, will be very happy if we can get going again with proper rate versus rhythm control trials. Thank you very much for these visionary words. Be before I, I pass the word to Filippo, let me uh, ask you one more question uh, concerning AFib. So e even if we admit that we have enough evidence to show that catheter ablation should be the preferred therapy, uh, there are many practical limitations for this approach. What are the trends we should expect in this field? Uh, are these uh, going to be managed just by electrophysiologists or should we expect more input from uh, interventional cardiologists or maybe some revival of, of, of the additional AA drugs? Well, another very interesting question, Robert. Um, I think it's important to appreciate that uh, the adult population, 2% of the adult population has atrial fibrillation. It's important to realize that about a quarter of us will definitely have atrial fibrillation before we die. So it's big business. Whether we can solve this problem all with ablation, I doubt. I would put my money much more in the long term on preventing the causations of atrial fibrillation. But for right now, I'm absolutely convinced 
that cardiac ablation will become more and more prominent and prevalent as a way of managing atrial fibrillation. It is clearly highly successful and the complications associated with it nowadays are relatively small. The technology has improved considerably, particularly the cryo balloon, I think, has already made its mark over and above radio frequency ablation. I also think that it's important to appreciate that uh, catheter ablation is uh, a technique which can utilize many other different forms of energy. And uh, so-called pulsed wave energy or electroporation is causing great excitement. It's clearly going to be um, a better technique than any that we have at the moment. And big trials are starting uh, in that particular area. For example, uh, the trial being done by the Bordeaux group, AFBeat, I think is going to be very exciting to watch and see how that develops using this new technology for electroporation. But having said that, not everything is quiet on the antiarrhythmic drug front. We have new antiarrhythmic drugs. Many of you listening may be absolutely surprised to hear that, but we do. We have some new drugs which are atrial specific. We have some new drugs which are single ion channels. Some are multiple ion channel blockers. We have some antiarrhythmic drugs which are not, own, not at all ion channel blockers, but which uh, uh, modify uh, the substrate and secondarily reduce the likelihood of atrial fibrillation. So I think it's going to be moving forward on all fronts. And I think that it's quite clear to me that uh, atrial fibrillation is going to take a battering. We are going to get on top of this arrhythmia. We neglected it for far too long. Now is the time to catch up and get the better of it. Thank you very much. Philippa, please, the stage is yours now. Well, John, thank you for this fascinating conversation. Uh, what about scores? Uh, scores are well used uh, in uh, medicine. And when we come to atrial fibrillation, risk prediction of uh, ischemic stroke is based on scores. The question is, are you happy with current scores? And where would you put your money? Uh, on which score in particular in the future? Well, Filippo, that's again a, a, a challenging question. Uh, with regard to scores predicting stroke, as you know, there have been two main scores, CHADS2 and chads fast which have been used predominantly in Europe and in North America. Other societies, other jurisdictions have picked up different ones. Japanese have done something quite different. The Canadians have done something a little different and so on. The problem is with all of these scores that the ROC curve demonstrates that they're not very good at predicting stroke from no stroke. It may be that Chad's Fask is good at picking out patients that are at low risk of stroke. And that may be its main advantage. But already people question, for example, the sex component or the SC at the end of Chad's VASC. Uh, they question the vascular component, whether that would be better addressed by using aspirin. That's the basis, for example, of the Canadian approach. The Australian approach is to eliminate uh, female gender from the score and so on. I think that uh, no one can be satisfied with these scores. The advantage of these simple clinical scores is you can see the patient, add up the score and immediately decide whether to anticoagulate the patient. If we want to add biomarkers, whatever that is, whether it's um, a CMR study, whether it's a plasma biomarker, whether it's an echocardiographic measurement, then we have to wait. Probably the patient has to go off and have an appointment, come back for another outpatient session, by which time you may have lost them to the system. You may, they may, may have had a stroke. They may have 
fallen uh, ill with other things and for one reason or another, you never get them anticoagulated. We have a huge problem in the sense that it's difficult to find large data sets of patients that have not been anticoagulated. So we can trawl through those data sets and find other possible combinations of comorbidity and, and biomarkers that would produce much better prediction. Some of the recent scores have been derived on patients who are anticoagulated largely. And so they really predict the patients who are not going to be effectively managed by anticoagulation. So it's hard to put them into the non-anticoagulated group and say, use these criteria because we know those are the ones least likely to be effectively managed by the anticoagulant. So I am sure uh, that we are going to need more predictions, but whether we'll be able to reduce them to a five, six or seven letter code and a few numerals to add up on our fingers. That's an entirely different matter. We might be harking back to, for example, what we were talking about with artificial intelligence. Perhaps that will give us much better approaches. There have been some studies. Some studies have shown much better than Chad's VASC. Other studies have shown not uh, much different to Chad's VASC, but of course, everything depends on what you can feed into the black box and what, what it can do with it. So I think that we will see that approach being used to develop new approaches to finding out which patients should be anticoagulated. It is absolutely unsatisfactory that we may anticoagulate three or four patients to every one that we protect from a stroke. It's not correct with a medicine that has a serious downside to it. But at the moment, that's the best we can do. But I would guess it won't be more than a, another few years before we have much, much better approach to identifying the patients at risk and the patients that will respond to this or that technology or pharmaceutical in order to respond effectively. So watch the space. I think it's going to be very active in the next few years. Thank you, John, for your exhaustive uh, response. And I agree with you. AI is probably in the future for in this field as in many other fields. Uh, I would like to bring you back to catheter ablation. We tend to, as doctors to put the emphasis on benefit more than on safety. But a possible reason of concern during atrial ablation and also during TAVI are silent brain infarctions. Is this a real concern in your opinion? Well, first of all, uh, we, we certainly know that during a, an ablation procedure, uh, we can have major or moderate strokes, usually because of the detachment of thrombus that's already formed in the atrium. Inadequate anticoagulation prior to the procedure, that sort of uh, fault in the system. But we also know that cerebral microemboli, and I think this is what you're referring to, often occur during an ablation procedure. It may be that, for example, it, some of it may be air embolus because of the transeptal approach. Some of it may be due to uh, causing heating of the blood, causing thrombosis because of the heating of the blood. Some of it may because, be because of uh, cauterizing the tissue and parts of those tissues detaching and embolizing. So there are many possible mechanisms by which these uh, cerebral microemboli may occur. And we, we saw this a lot, uh, I would say four or five years ago, we were very concerned about it, particularly with radio frequency ablation with multi uh, multipole catheters, so-called PVAC catheters, but they, they were a particular hazard. Uh, they've now been largely eliminated. And in many centers, we've moved away from radio frequency all the time. So we don't have those heating issues to worry us. However, if we look at patients, uh, you can still detect uh, these microemboli using say Doppler techniques. You can do MRIs and show these small uh, micro lesions in, uh, scattered throughout the brain. You can see, however, that they're not large. 
Uh, if you repeat the study, you can see that many of them disappear. There's no permanent scar formation in most cases. If you do tests on uh, uh, mini mental state tests, for example, you can find often there is a slight deterioration following an ablation study. But if you keep testing, that doesn't seem to be permanent. And in fact, because you're effectively managing the atrial fibrillation and you don't have necessarily the consequences of that arrhythmia uh, in terms of uh, cerebral microemboli, then things may actually get considerably better. So I think at the moment, we're not too concerned about it, certainly in the area of ablating uh, atrial fibrillation. We know about it, we can document it, seems not to be causing too much permanent damage. And if anything, the whole procedure taken at length and in the future seems to be reducing uh, cognitive dysfunction. Thank you, John. Uh, one question again about drugs. Before you were mentioning some new drugs on the horizon, antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, which are fascinating. Uh, what about upstream prevention of atrial fibrillation? What do you see in that direct, in, in this regard? Well, that as I, I've already intimated, I believe that that is a major area of research that we must uh, pursue because I think that the bang for the buck is really in that area. Uh, but uh, for the most part, this has not proved very beneficial to date. Been more beneficial, I think, in the ventricle in terms of reducing the likelihood of sudden cardiac death. Uh, but uh, it is documented to be effective in management of hypertension to an extent. It is not uh, shown to be documented, uh, documented well for many of the pathologies. We're interested, uh, well, let me first of all uh, point to the RACE trial, uh, RACE uh, 4, I think it was, where patients with persistent AF coming to cardioversion were treated for all the underlying cardiovascular risk factors, including cholesterol ab abnormalities uh, and so on and so forth with ACE inhibitors, RAS inhibitors, and so on. And they did demonstrate it, that, that the recurrence of the arrhythmia following the cardioversion <clears throat> was much less in the aggressively managed patients with upstream therapies. So that was uh, pointing us in the right direction but we're definitely not getting anywhere near where we need to be. And I think this is largely because <clears throat> when atrial fibrillation occurs, the underlying mechanisms that are leading to the substrate development for atrial fibrillation have been present for so long. They have already done much of the damage. Now, if we take a situation in which, for example, atrial fibrillation develops in a heart failure patient, so the AF is only just beginning, then it may well be quite possible using some specific management to get rid of that atrial fibrillation. I'm thinking specifically about bucindolol, in which uh, one half the population with a particular genotype respond extremely well in terms of not getting progression or recurrences or even occurrence of atrial fibrillation in a heart failure population. The other half, the drug has no effect. Very exciting. We don't know the mechanism for why that happens, but we are beginning to see lights at the end of the tunnel. Thank you, John. And uh, let's come now to a women's affair. Uh, women in most of arrhythmia trials are underrepresented. Do you think that we have a general sex-related issue with interventional therapy of arrhythmias, including implantation of pulse generators? I think we have uh, sex problems throughout medicine, shall we say. I think almost all of medicine has demonstrated that uh, women are less effectively identified with problems, less effectively managed with problems, and so on and so forth. And that's certainly true in uh, the electrophysiology arena. If we just take devices, for example, far fewer women <clears throat> are paced, far fewer women receive ICDs, far fewer women receive CRT therapy. We don't know why this is. There's clearly a different mixture 
of underlying or um, adjacent comorbidity, which may have some effect. I mean, the, the causation or the reason for the implantation may be different with different patterns of uh, confounding or underlying comorbidities. Uh, but I think it's also got a lot to do with reticence on the part of women, either to be included in trials or to, be, to receive various interventional treatments in particular. There have been several papers that have shown that if cardiologists sit down and explain the advantages of an intervention, like a pacemaker or an ICD, and counsel the patient, then the patient, the woman patient, will often change her mind. But if you're not careful, uh, many women may refuse for a variety, often of social reasons, nothing to do with uh, their underlying condition. So I think counseling is probably the most important thing and keeping an eye out for whether this is happening in your own practice. Thank you, John, for these wise suggestions. Well, I see now a question from the audience from uh, Nicola Maurea. Uh, he works in an oncological hospital in, in Naples. And the question is about the Garfield AF registry. Any lessons uh, regarding the relation between AF, cancer, and NOAC from this registry? Uh, it's a very interesting question, of course. We, we've seen uh, some publications on this, of course, from other registries and other clinical trials. Garfield Registry has a large number of AF patients, 52,000 of them, but cancer at baseline was not recorded. Cancer during the progress of the trial was recorded. And therefore, it is possible for us to look at incident cancer during the follow-up of the trial. And quite a lot of the follow-up is not just two years. The minimum was two years, but some patients go as long as five or six years. Uh, it is possible to look at those patients because we did track the development of cancer in Garfield. So we could provide some information for Nicolau. Uh, but uh, I doubt if we will have enough in the CRFs to be really satisfying for him. Thank you, John. Robert, I'm sure you have other questions for Professor Khan. Thank you very much, Filippo. Uh, well, during this pandemic, unfortunate time, we cannot really travel, but so let us travel at least from the atria to the ventricles. <laughs> uh, the, the current post-MI indications uh, for, for the primary preventative ICD implantations are based on trials published 20 years ago. And even more, these trials were done with patients who had their index MI a quarter century ago. In addition, we have now novel, sometimes maybe surprisingly effective drugs. Uh, so are the indications based on these old trials still valid? And do you expect new tools for identifying patients with high risk for sudden cardiac death? You mentioned that uh, you was very excited about these questions in your collaboration with, with Professor Malik Malik. Uh, so what is your opinion on the, on the development here? Well, you're quite right, Robert. Uh, many of us are very concerned that data collected a quarter of a century ago may not be applicable to modern medicine. So much has changed, particularly in heart failure and in the care of acute coronary syndrome. It's very differently done these days, and it's likely that the implications of a single risk factor which is ejection fraction, which is all that is in use, is inadequately to, to identify the patients that should receive ICD therapy. Not only that, of course, we also know from a whole variety of publications that the proportion of patients who have been fitted with ICDs in modern years are not using their devices half as much as patients did 20 years ago. And so we are clearly, this is for primary prevention addressing here. So clearly something has changed and I suspect it is the state of cardiology management generally. So we do have to think 
about challenging this. And I think all of us are probably aware of the Danish study. Now, the Danish study took that central argument that you just put, Robert, and put it to the test and randomized patients with non-ischemic low ejection fractions to receive a device or not. Now, that was a very brave trial. It was just about possible because there's less certainty in the non-ischemic low ejection fraction patient that an ICD is the answer to reducing sudden cardiac death. So they were able to randomize those patients. When they did, they showed that there was no effect in terms of all-cause mortality. There was a small, non -sig hardly significant effect on cardiovascular mortality and sudden cardiac death did change, but it was very small. So they really set the world alight in thinking about this problem more. And others are now trying to do similar trials in an ischemic population. Uh, for example, um, Gerd Hendricks in Leipzig is doing the Profid trial, series of trial, doing that in ischemic patients. And of course, it's really challenging ethically to do it. So how do you take talk to a patient and say, the guidelines say I should do this, but I'd like to randomize you to doing this or not doing it? It's difficult to do. It's equally difficult to say, well, I'm not going to take much notice of the ejection fraction, but uh, I'd like us to try a different uh, risk factor. Let's take, for example, CMR, scars in a, detected by CMR. And let's use that to uh, indicate whether you should have a device. Let's use that as a criterion. Ethically, this is difficult. And I, as I said before, I think that guideline committees have got to start thinking about how we can challenge data from a long time ago when it seems that it's possibly no longer as relevant as it were. And they should consider whether they should have starred recommendations, meaning potentially unsafe, as I said before, or whether they should downgrade the recommendation from class one to class two or something of that sort to open up the field for further study. With regard to the particular uh, new biomarkers, I think, I think that uh, uh, SCARs and uh, uh, particular border zone SCARs and channels within those border zones are all very relevant issues that may be far more effective in a SCAR-based uh, type of pathology like ischemic heart disease uh, than is the ejection fraction, and we should start doing that. The only thing that is currently much used is VT stimulation on top of the ejection fraction. Others have tried, of course, signal average ECGs and uh, heart rate variability and so on and so forth, but I don't think anything stands as good a chance as looking at the scar, its characteristics, its border zones, and the like. And I think we'll see some results from that kind of work fairly soon. Thank you very much for your, for your wise uh, view on this complicated topic. And I, I like especially, uh, you have mentioned that uh, I believe twice during our conversation that sometimes, somehow we became prisoners of our guidelines in planning new research. So I think this is a very, very important ethical issue. But you know, let me now come to a question. I have asked our younger colleagues from the young EP community, what would they like to ask uh, Professor Kemp during this interview? And one of the questions which came out is the following. Uh, you are certainly worldwide highly recognized as an outstanding speaker. So, so what do you recommend to our young colleagues for developing and perfectioning skills crucial for, a, for an excellent speaker? Well, I think this is relevant to almost all young physicians because one way or another, they're going to be speaking to colleagues, making presentations, 
they may not necessarily have aspirations to travel around the world speaking or giving talks, but all of them will have to present data. So I think it's worthwhile paying a little attention to it during their training. They should, I think, uh, first of all, understand their subject very well. Secondly, they must understand their audience, who they are talking to. And thirdly, they must understand the limitations that they have and the techniques that they're going to use have in terms of communicating the data. Most data is transferred using a combination of uh, speech and slides. I found it incredibly useful that I would have a single template for all the slides I made. Now I talk, <laughs> I talk with in great seriousness about this because if you put your slides on all different backgrounds, it's really difficult to reassemble them into other talks. Therefore, always put it on. And I think a white background is critical. If you put them on colored backgrounds, then any bitmaps you take are going to stand out as bitmaps and not look as well as they would if they were against a white background. I think it's really important to limit the amount of information you put on a slide. I think you, before you give a talk, you have to work out what the first few sentences are going to be. That will get you comfortable with speaking. It will get you started if you have rehearsed that. And then on every slide, one of the things I do is I pick out the four points that I want to make from what is on the slide. Let's say four, it could be three or five, but the number of points you want to make and what order you want to make them in. It doesn't take very long to do that. You can even often just put a one, a two and a three on various parts of your slide to guide you to talk about those two or three things that you wish to identify. Then I think, of course, you need to practice the talk to a degree so you are comfortable with it. Obviously, I don't practice most of my talks from end to end now, but I'm still creating the first few sentences of every talk that I give because it gets me into doing the talk. I think it's really critical to be enthusiastic to speak slowly and to appeal to the audience that you're speaking to. So although you may not be expecting active questions, I think what you can do is make them see that you are receptive to their feedback. And I think that is a really important element, the communication element, looking at people directly, for example. There are all sorts of tips that you can give to people giving talks, and I'd be happy to talk at much greater length about it sometime else, but I think I, I said enough for today. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great advice. Uh, well, John, uh, you are not only an outstanding cardiologist, but also a very innovative editor. What about your experience as editor of the ESC textbook of cardiovascular medicine? and as uh, editor of ESJ case reports? Well, uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, the European textbook, the European Society Cardiology textbook of cardiovascular medicine started off in 2006, at least, well, we started work on it in 2002. So it's been going for almost 20 years. It's come now to its third edition and the pace of change in cardiology is so fast, the need for readily available data and for comprehensive data is so much that we've had to change from having a single volume text to a digital format. There is a third edition in book form, but it contains far less than the digital version, which is called ESC CardioMed. And I recommend that to everyone listening, all the professional members and fellows of the ESC get this as a member benefit. It's very comprehensive, about a thousand authors involved. Uh, every subject within cardiology is well covered. We have four editors, Tom Lucia, uh, Gerald Mora, 
Patrick uh, Serres and myself, and we've had a great time putting this together and keeping it up to date. And this is the big challenge. And the even greater challenge is to try and keep up with the guidelines because we're supposed to produce the evidence base on which the guidelines can rest. So the guidelines can become shorter and shorter. But at the same time, we have to contain within our book as much of the accurate, up-to-date guideline as possible. And it's really difficult because of all the confidentiality issues to actually achieve that. But it's a great thrill to work on that. And finally, uh, European Heart Journal case reports. This is a journal that's three years old, just a little over three years. It was put together because there was no other case report journal within cardiology. Now, surprisingly, there are quite a few that followed our example, but this was the first one. And the idea was to provide a vehicle for youngsters predominantly to write their very first piece for publication. Case reports is how they can learn to publish in the first place. So we started off thinking, well, we will provide a journal which will have case reports. We won't care anything about impact, impact factor, because otherwise you'd throw all the case reports out. What we're interested in is, uh, is uh, out metrics. In other words, the other indices or the, by which you can assess the value of a journal. And we wanted to tr not only publish, but train the authors, train the young editors, train the reviewers, and set up a system whereby lots of people could be part within the family of EHJ case reports, and nobody would be so badly pressed and hard worked by it that they had to give up any of their day job. So we wanted to stop people working as hard as you, Filippo, in EHJ case reports. They had to be people who only had really an hour or so to spend per week on the journal. But we have a lot of them and a lot of people to coordinate it. And it's tremendously exciting, a very high quality uh, journal. And it's also in many ways a family structure. And we're very proud of it. John, this has been a very pleasant and long discussion, but I have one final question for you. A question I'm asking to all our guests. What are your suggestions for the future of EHJ Dialogues? Well, that's an, an interesting question. I, I think you should continue to do them. Obviously, you get a sizable audience of people who like to listen. Uh, and I think it is an opportunity for for EHJ to record some of the history of cardiovascular medicine from some of the people that were involved in making that history. It's also, I think, an opportunity of asking those people that have trodden the path through the developments of cardiovascular medicine to give their views on where it's going, as you have asked me today. And I think that together the history and the future given by somebody who straddles the past and lives in the present is a very valuable contribution. Thank well, you. this concludes our dialogue. I wish to thank Robert Attala, Attala and John Kahn for their participation to this fascinating dialogue. Dear John, I, I do believe that with your charisma and your impeccable English, Sooner or later, you will become an excellent prime minister. That would be a loss for cardiology, unfortunately. Well, I'm now happy to announce that the next dialogue will be as usual on the last Thursday of the month, and therefore on April 29th at 17 CET. Well, our uh, next guest will be Barbara Cassaday, Cassaday, past president of the European Society of Cardiology. I hope to meet all of you and many more on that occasion. Thank you again. Bye, John, and bye, Robert. Thank you bye. very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So just uh, stay on the line while everybody signs off. <laughs>